Let's take a look at our community and biome notes. This is chapter three. First of all, we know that limiting factors are going to help determine what's in our communities. And limiting factors are biotic and abiotic things that restrict the number of organisms, the way organisms reproduce, where they're distributed, and which ones exist. So what are some examples of those? We have sunlight, climate, atmospheric gases, temperature, which is part of climate, water or precipitation, which is also part of climate. So when we think of climate, we think of water and precipitation, nutrients um, or food for the organisms, um, fire, whether it be um, natural or man-made, soil composition, how um, what that soil is made up and what it can um, sustain, what kind of life it can sustain, the space that is available, and competition, predation, and parasitism. All of these are limiting factors. They're going to limit the number of organisms, where they're at, their reproduction ability, and things like that. Tolerance, when we took a look at our um, um, salt water tank, we had some limiting factors in there. And they, the, depending on what those limiting factors were and what their readings were, those um, some organisms could tolerate changes in those pHs and ammonia levels and those kind of things and others could not. So tolerance is the ability of an organism to survive even though there's changes in the biotic or abiotic factors. Some organisms, for example, can be tolerant of, a, um, uh, of changes in the area, which means they could live, but their tolerance doesn't allow them to reproduce. So they would only be in that area for one generation. And this is our ranges of tolerance. We have the greatest number of organisms in our optimum range here. So we our lower limit being on the left and our upper limit being on the um, right. And when you look at increased populations, the lower limits and the upper limits, we um, don't have a lot of organisms. And then as we get um, uh, in the areas of the zone of stresses, we have less organisms. And then our optimum range is where most of our organisms live. So we're going to talk a little bit about succession. We have a biological, ecological succession, and there's two kinds of them, primary and secondary. First of all, exactly what is the succession? It's when um, change comes and it occurs to a community and an ecosystem. And species that can be found in a particular e ecosystem can change over time. Primary um, succession is when you have the uh, colonization of an area of land that is barren, rock-like, by organisms. And the very first organisms that appear are called the primary species. These are the first species to inhabit an area. Examples of these could be lichen, algae, bacteria, protease. These colonize bare rock, things like lava flows. And here's a picture of a lava flow. And if you look closely, you can see some of that in the in the igneous rock there. But when the rot lava comes, it covers everything and just leaves rock. So when it's on barren or rock-like land, it is um, considered primary succession. Here's another example of primary succession. Climax community is an, a community that is stable. It um, stays relatively the same or unchanged over a period of time. And it represents a, a variety of different ecosystems. Usually we have mature forest or grassland, coral reefs, tundra, etc. So this is a, a community that has reached its um, um, kind of maximum maturity. Secondary succession is the second type of biological or ecological succession. And this is changes that take place after an existing community is disrupted. This eruption can be either natural or it can be human influence. So it could be natural like a fire or a hurricane or a flood. Um, human influences we could, you know, due to construction like the succession that we talked about in our, our school property, farming, a controlled burn those type of things. And with success, secondary succession, you have to know that there's soil present for the organisms to um, be able to start to recolonize. Here's an example of that. This kind of looks like that area um, by our parking lot at the build, at school also. We have our, our um, primary succession there coming back from um, soiled land that was changed for some reason in that area. There are two different types of biomes that we want to talk about, aquatic and terrestrial biomes. First of all, biomes 
are are influenced by the region they are in the earth and that has to do with their latitude and their ocean currents these are will influence the climate of different parts of the earth and so the latitude the closer you are to the equator um, the warmer it's going to be Lat the ocean currents um, we do know that bodies of water can cool and warm land masses depending on what is what the currents are if we're having an El Nino coming through or we have warm currents or cool currents and we know that this is something that happens in Lake Erie frequently. Um, latitude describes our position in degrees um, north and south of the equator, which is also going to be, de uh, de will also affect the amount of sun that, that the regions are getting throughout the year. So we're going to first talk a little bit about saltwater ecosystems, kind of goes on with our tank. Remember, we, had, we checked our temperature in our tank, our pH levels, our ammonia levels. An estuary estuary is where we have different types of water merge where we can get um, waters of different temperatures different salt content pH levels and so you kind of get your own uh, unique ecosystem there because there's some organisms that can tolerate those changes and some that cannot you have what's called an intertidal zone this is an area where salt water and land meet and that you get an alt alternately you know, the water submerges and then it recedes and it exposes the the land it submerges it, recedes, and exposes the land. That's an intertidal zone. We have also different oceanic zones, and these can be separated into variety zones based on how deep they are and how close they are to the shoreline. So here's one picture here. We have um, our uh, littoral zone right here, which is right up by the um, coastline. We have our pelagic zone. And we have an area where we have limited amount of sunlight that can penetrate to it. And um, we're going to talk about those different zones. First, we have our intertidal zone. And this is the ultimately submerged and subland, exposed land area. We have a continental shelf, which continues, that our continents are made of, that does continue for a while into the um, water. And so this is a relatively shallow area of water there's high diversity of light there and it's this area that's just submerged um, still submerged underwater but it's for, it's still part of the continental shelf and so this is where we ha tend to have lots of diversity or different types of organisms that live there the pelagic zone is where we have open water this is where most of our um, organisms that are moving around are at the benthic zone is the seafloor of both the continental crutch crust shelf and the pelagic zone. So light ability is important because the amount of light that something can get into is going to help affect what type of organisms can live there. So we have one zone that's called the photic zone and we know that from our um, prefixes that um, photo means um, light. So photic zone is an area where light can penetrate. It's from the surface to about a couple meters down. Aphotic, we know that the prefix a means no, not, or non. And so this is the non um, light zone. This is the portion of the water beneath the photic zone where light can't penetrate or get down. We have our phytoplankton. We know that phyto is plant. And so phytoplankton is plant like plant plankton, and it is the base of our um, uh, aquatic food chains. And this is where photosynthesis. Uh, is performed by, um, uh, they perform photosynthesis, phytoplankton do. We have zooplankton also, which is a uh, primary food source for many saltwater environments, and um, those are animal-like plankton and also freshwater environments. Again, here's a picture of our zones after we talked about them. And here's our freshwater biome. Please notice that the most on our picture, the greatest species diversity is up on uh, near the shoreline there. It's close to the edge where the continental shelf is still in there. The next type of biomes that we're going to talk about are our terrestrial biomes. And we know that terrestrial means land. So these are our land biomes. And these just are important. And there's a lot of this is going to be on the test. And um, they are areas on the continents that are characterized or put together 
by similar climates and thus resulting in similar types of organisms because it is the climate that is going to do, dictate what types of organisms are going to be able to survive there. First we have our tropical forests. We have our climograph on the right hand side knowing that our top numbers, <clears throat> our top um, bars have to do with the temperature and our bottom ones here have to do with precipitation. Our precipitation numbers are on the right hand side and the temperature ones are on the left. So in tropical forests, we, these are areas that are close to the equator and that's why we get those higher temperatures. They can be um, tropical rainforests or they can be tropical dry forests. Um, they rel have usually have very poor soil and this is because in the lower layer, lower canopy of those areas, it's usually wet and um, dark and warm and those are areas where things that decompose um, can de decompose things quickly so we have rapid decomposition and recycling of materials thus me me meaning that the soil sample is usually relatively poor and here's a beautiful picture of this and this kind of goes along with our 90 minutes of um, biomes next is our savannas and our grasslands these are biomes that are dominated by grasses and small scattered trees. And if you look down on the climograph at the amount of per, um, precipitation in blue, you'll see that there's not a lot of precipitation. And the, that is why the um, plant life there are grasses and small scattered trees. It doesn't have a lot of large trees and large numbers of trees and bigger or, um, plants and et cetera there because it does not have the water supply to um, um, have those. Here's some beautiful pictures of grasslands. And if you notice, if you look through, you can kind of see through that the, the um, um, vegetation is lower to the ground and not real clustered together. Next is our deserts. And our desert biomes are defined more by the lack of water, not by their temperatures. And this is because deserts can be hot and cold. During the day, they're very hot. They can get pretty cool at night. Deserts can be created by things called rain shadows. And this is um, where we get dry areas on the side of mountains because we know that evaporation causes the um, water to, uh, to go up into the clouds and they're going to stay in the clouds until the precipitation is heavy enough in the clouds that it's going to come out. We know that when clouds rise into the atmosphere, the atmosphere is cooler. With the cooler temperature, the molecules of water get closer together, they get more dense, it gets heavier and then they start to fall as they rise and that's why over mountain ranges on one side of the range you have usually have a lot of precipitation and you have a lot of snow on the top because it gets heavy and it's cold up there it comes down as snow so by the time it gets over to the other side of the mountain range there's no precipitation left and so you get those dry areas created and that's called rain shadowing and that is on the test um, so spreading deserts can threaten certain areas so for example in Africa we have our um, true deserts, which are our orange areas um, here. And then we have areas that are moderate risk of what we call decertification. And this is where we end up making these areas to be desert-like. And that happens um, because we're, um, as a result of growing human populations, we're overpopulating, we're letting the land get overgrazed by um, animals. We are basically changing the climate in that area, causing um, biomes um, to become deserts. If you look at the climograph right there of the desert, you'll see that um, there's a nice temperature range. It's not just hot, but look at the precipitation. It's very, very low. And thus we said that's what classifies a desert. Next is our temperate forests, and these are dominated by large trees, hardwood trees that require sufficient moisture. And if you look at the moisture level here and you compare it to that of the, the grasslands, we, there is significantly more um, rainfall here in the temperate forest. This is our deciduous trees, and these are trees that lose their leaves during the cold season. Here's a beautiful picture of a fall um, in a deciduous forest. Next we have a carnivorous forest, and these principal trees are um, carnivorous, which means they have cones in them. They usually are needle-like evergreens um, and they remain green all winter long. They have, many of them have adapted 
for fires, for periodic fires. And the reason for that is, for example, the pine cones and such, but the, that's the seeds for these, these um, all year round pine trees. They are, the seeds are dispersed and activated when those cones get hot. So if you have a fire come through and destroy everything, when it burns up those, those pine cones or those cones of the coniferous trees, they will let loose those seeds. So the, one of some of the first things that are going to colonize during that primary succession that's going to come after that fire are these pine trees, which is really important because these are trees that um, allow for habitat for certain organisms and protection and that type of thing. The taiga is the um, northern boreal forest. These have fewer trees, harsher winters than coniferous, but they're just south of the tundra. So this would be the northern part of some of Canada is something that we would understand as the taiga. So here are some examples of those. Next we have, and last we have our tundra. These are the arctic areas and the tops of mountains, and these are areas where um, the temperatures are pretty cool most of the year round. There are times of the year when the temperatures do get warmer, but there is a permanent frost in the ground. We call it the permafrost, and it's just a few inches below, the, a, a few feet below the surface, and it stays frozen all year long, even when it is um, warm outside. It doesn't ever stays warm enough long enough for that to melt. Because of that, the plant life is very low to the ground and uh, because that's where the root system can support it. And there are no real trees because the, the roots can't get through that permafrost there. So those are all of our biomes and that's the end of our notes right now. And those biomes will all be on the test um, as we go through.